Okay. Uh, I am going to get us started. I'm Caitlin Halper, and Vice Chair of the Development Review Board. I'm calling the meeting to order for Tuesday, June 6th. Uh, our agenda is accurate as posted online, right? We haven't had any changes. Uh, that's correct. Okay. Um, all communications have been posted online. Is that right? Correct. Did anything come in late? Um, I posted something for Mr. Trombley that was submitted, I think it was Friday. It was a self elevation of the prior house design, I think. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and then minutes have been shared in the last meeting, so we're set there. Um, and then we will go through the public hearing in the order that it's here. So that is starting with ZP 23 33, 120 Depot Street. Um, we have, yeah, yes, you do. And you're already up front. Is anyone else here to speak on that matter? We might, we might respond depending on what Stephen Trump's okay. proposes. And is there anyone online who wishes to speak on this? Uh, if you're an attendee and want to speak on this item, uh, raise your hand, please. Uh, we do have at least one person. No, there's two. We have Rory Waterman and Sharon Busher raising their hands to speak. Okay. For the sake of simplicity, I'm going to swear in everyone who's here first, and then we'll do the digital swearing in. You can do it. <laughs> um, so those of you who might speak, um, if you raise your right hand and swear to tell you just for this first item. Okay. Um, <laughs> be sorry to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth on this matter under the of surgery. I do. I do. I, I do. do. I do. I do. I do. I heard Sharon Busher said I do. So then we've got one other person on that. Uh, the other individual lowered their hand. Okay. We'll see who it is then. Um, Let's back up again. Sorry. I guess we're uh, changing minds, Caitlin. Uh, Rory has hand up. So, Rory, you can be sworn in. This has audio people. I do. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, just a point of clarification, um, this is a variance request. There's no development included. Um, if the variance were to be approved, uh, then an application for development is uh, All right, so. Showing this for reference. Okay. So, we have the applicant. That would be you. Uh, and we don't have microphone or a camera today, which is okay. But do you want to start and walk us through? Do you want your engineers to start and walk us through the project? Oh, How do you want to do this? Not my engineers. I'm, okay. I'm me. This is my son, Evan. Okay. <laughs> He's here for moral support and to learn a little about what's going on. So, uh, okay. Uh, why don't you then walk us through the application and the all right. project and sure. your proposals? All right. I will do that. Thank you. So, this property has obviously been something of interest for a number of folks over the years, including me. And uh, finally, at the point where I was able to uh, consider it, it was uh, came back up on the market. So I uh, I'm just trying to give you a little background, so I don't think I'm wandering too far off here from that point in the beginning, but. Uh, so I uh, signed a contract with contingencies. Um, one of those being that I could verify that I would be able to do the type of project that we needed for our, it's a, a house for my wife and I and our sons for uh, our retirement and a place for him to live. Um, so once I had signed that contract, I met with Scott and folks at uh, Public Works and uh, electric department and, and excavators, low law to uh, 
make sure that there was a viable, feasible uh, path to us being able to complete what we wanted to do. Uh, Scott was one of the first that I met with uh, at the time when uh, we met. Uh, it was uh, the 21st of June, 2021. I uh, met with Scott. Uh, it wasn't him specifically. I came in to find out what was required to do it, but he happened to uh, make himself available to, to chat with me. So uh, I showed him the preliminary sketches, which um, if anyone's interested, I do have those here. But uh, mostly I was just looking to find out if my vision would uh, be something that was likely to be suitable and um, pass muster with you folks. Uh, and at the time, Scott uh, indicated that it was suitable for the site was pretty much his, you know, he wasn't committing to anything, but he did say that the, uh, the uh, drawing that I presented did more or less conform to what might be acceptable on, on that site. So once that and uh, the, we redid a variance for the setback off from of Depot Street because the, the yeah. idea of overriding uh, setback rules uh, wouldn't have allowed the development on the site. So we got that into place as well before I committed to buying the property. Okay. So once that was all in place, uh, I uh, closed on the property and we moved forward with the process of coming up with better plans and uh, putting a plan in place to get it through design review board. Now, I did not uh, push the process terribly quickly uh, because I wasn't planning on doing anything until the next spring anyway. Uh, but unbeknownst to me, uh, the process was in place or was moving forward to change the uh, way the height allowance was calculated for a a house on the slope. Uh, when I started the process, it was uh, based on an average of the elevation around the perimeter of the building, thus giving you some um, allowance for being on a slope so that uh, the average height was you know, somewhere up on the slope as opposed to the to lower edge of the property. Okay. And that's what I was counting on for. Um, moving forward the process because the the house that I was uh, envisioning, which uh, to be honest was based somewhat on some uh, design development that a previous uh, property owner had done on it, but decided it uh, wouldn't work for them. So I was not starting from scratch, if you would. Uh, so I was assigned uh, a young man to, be my guide through the process here. Um, and my first point, now that I've uh, kind of wandered around here a little bit, is that all through this process, I was never made aware that the uh, changes were happening from uh, the uh, perspective of the, the calculation of how the height of the building was uh, calculated to meet code. Okay. And uh, honestly, after the fact, it, it uh, came to my attention that the first uh, public uh, discussion was the day after I met with Scott. So it was obviously in process by then. It was not anything I was aware of. So uh, when I first put my application in, it was uh, still with that understanding and that, that was the, the published um, ordinance was to use those uh, five point, I forget which one it is, article five anyway, that um, 
this would be used for that calculation, which would allow me to move forward with the design that is similar to what you see on the, the screen. Um, so I talked to the young man who's no longer with the uh, um, zoning department. Uh, and he apparently was unaware that these changes were happening to the uh, Article 5. So we continue to move forward through those eight months um, with me never becoming aware that there was going to be a change in the article. So uh, once I had it through the advisory board and we had everything ready, um, he said, yeah, you're good to go um, to the review board and it'll be up to them to you know, approve the design. And uh, so we were good to go until I got an email from him the next day that said, uh, I was wrong. The uh, way the height is calculated is different now. So uh, your design is not going to work. Um, so at that point, I asked him what my options were. And uh, I asked him if I could see you folks about grandfathering me into what was in place when I started the process. And he said, no, that, that was not something that was really likely to pass. And really, I either had to meet the new Article 5 or put the original design in front of you folks and hope that you would take that into consideration that uh, this had happened during that process. Um, so I wanted to kind of make that clear. Frankly, I feel like uh, I came into this process thinking it was a collaborative or cooperative process where these folks were helping me to make sure that, you know, we were, that I was meeting the requirements and that they would you know, make me aware of any issues that would not allow that to happen. And the fact that there obviously had to be an awareness as they're the folks that um, wrote up and, and uh, presented the changes to the board, whichever one it is that controls the uh, changing the articles. Uh, that they would not have brought that to my attention. Uh, I, I don't understand, and that frankly makes me feel like that I came into something that uh, turned out to be an adversarial process if they're not willing to share and be honest about what's going on and that uh, there was going to be a change that would have a significant impact on me. Uh, and obviously, I didn't feel that that was right. That there wasn't much I could do about it. Um, so that being said, I wanted you folks to be aware of that before I, I started presenting all of the other reasons why, um, now that I have to do this variance, which frankly, if, if I had been told right up front that that was going to change, I could have easily had my completed application in place before things changed on April 6th of 2022. Well, um, I appreciate that background. Uh, we have an application in front of us right now. Mm -hmm. A number of people here want to speak on this item and other items. So sure. You would just walk well, through yeah. why you're entitled to the variance. Or right. The I, and frankly, that's part, I, I find that to be a legitimate part of the reason why I think I should be allowed this variance is okay. the fact that uh, frankly, I should have been made aware of this uh, from day one when I talked to Scott, since he uh, was obviously very aware of it. At the very least, he should have said uh, there is a uh, public discussion tomorrow night that you should sit in on because it's going to impact this process. Because he was uh, very familiar with this particular property and knew what was going on with it. So there were no mysteries there. We, we've heard that. Okay. All right, well, um, I'm just covering all the bases because uh, I'm not aware of what everyone has, has not heard. All right, 
And this is something that's important to me and my family, so I want to make sure I cover the pieces. All right. So uh, moving on as you are requesting. So to begin with, right up front, along with talking to Scott, I, I uh, contacted the condo association behind me and, and uh, had a meeting with them to show them what I was doing up to so that we can make that a cooperative process as well. Uh, so, you know, I did all of my upfront homework. So there was no mystery to me. And it was obviously quite a shock that all of a sudden my design was not going to be uh, appropriate or adequate without any forewarning. So there you have it. Uh, so the design that I am asking for is quite similar to the design that is there now, only a little lower to keep under the 60 foot uh, limitation that you folks have for anything in the waterfront zone. Uh, I think it's uh, under Article 12 that it, it mentions the 60 foot maximum that you folks are allowed to offer for something in that particular waterfront zone. And we used to have that height, but it was changed and the limit now is 35 feet. And Article 12 is the variance article, whereby we would have to find, uh, based on the factors in 12.1A through F, uh, that the unique Characteristics of the site render development impossible, but for the variance. Right. And so uh, my that my intent with this uh, um, redesign essentially is lowering it was to have it fall within that acceptable range, uh, and that I what I'm hopefully presenting to you will demonstrate that is there it would be appropriate. From a construction level, I'm going to try to ask some questions to get to sure. we need to decide. Um, from a construction perspective, is it impossible to build a house less than 35 feet to roof height when measured from the front of the house? Not if you're willing to live in a cave. All right, I, uh, I believe you folks have a design that shows that uh, over 70% of the house would be underground. So uh, my understanding is that it's not impossible necessarily that would be the uh, hurdle that I need to jump, but one that is reasonable um, to the circumstances, if you would. And so essentially, if I'm correct, so these are, there are some, we have in our file some 2022 designs, right? That show the site with a 35 foot house. Do I have that right? That sounds correct. As the picture, and it shows you that uh, if you're looking at this one right here. Yeah. What, what square footage is the house? It's, uh, just under 2,000, like 1,900 square feet. And so that house that's in that diagram you just held up is 35 mm -hmm. feet plus or minus to the top. Yes. Okay. And your current request is to essentially take those top two floors and elevate them on jacks, which would require us to give you a variance to 60 feet. Do I have that right? A variance up to 60 feet, yes which gets the majority of the house out of the ground. And their basis for your request is you'd like not to have, if I look at that side view, mm -hmm. you know, the below ground sections mm -hmm. below ground. For the upper two levels, that is correct. Okay. Okay. Um, so, the design that I'm looking for is in basically uh, starting with the same current, you know, uh, concept and uh, parameters that I was looking at for the original house. Okay. Uh, if you uh, were to refer to a uh, document dated for April 23, additional comments, the uh, 
Number four, kind of list the ones that are uh, you know, applicable to this discussion that we were just having about being under round. Uh, it's the house's size to hopefully make it, uh, it's only a two bedroom house, uh, but our younger son who is, um, has challenges, I guess is the most kind way to put it. So he's going to be living with us for the foreseeable future. We need to have a house that will accommodate a 20 something along with his mother and I. Uh, so that is why we are looking to have at least a certain size with a, you know, two bedrooms and uh, space for us to function as adults in our own space. Obviously, I'm not sure that any of the folks here would be excited about living in an underground house. <laughs> Some folks are. That's not the one that's good enough for us. But one of the challenges that uh, is also a, a downside for being around like that is that it brings all of the uh, living space down to where it is accessible to all of the other folks that tend to be around in that area, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with all of the, the folks that live there. Frankly, if we were to have to build the lower house, uh, I wouldn't be able to get my wife to live there because she has concerns about uh, the nature of folks in that area. Um. I think we understand the presentation. I want to see if the board has any questions. If I'm not finished. finished. Okay. Do you want to speak to their specific criteria that we have to consider on our second? Absolutely. And, and, and forgive me, I'm not speak. trying to be rude, but I, I just feel I don't want to get cut off. But if you can ask questions that will help me better answer your uh, concerns, then please uh, forgive my uh, okay. being up here. We'll do that. Um, what are the unique physical circumstances or conditions of this lot? Period. Question mark. And how do those create an unnecessary hardship on urban development? The circumstances that create this scenario obviously are the fact that the uh, entire property is on a very steep grade slope. And uh, if this had have been the rules in place when I purchased the property and started the application process, I, I would have never ever purchased it because uh, this is not something that I'll be able to have my family live in. And um, you did get a 10 yard front setback, right? A 10 foot, yes. You had some designs for the house then. Yep. And those were within what height? What was the height of the house you proposed then? That one right there. That one right there. So where did the designs come from that showed the house partially buried? I just drew this up to match the uh, current Article 5 description of what it had to meet. When you filed for the 10-foot setback, did you submit those particular plans? No, there were no plans submitted because it was uh, for the setback, it was not part of the discussion. So prior to the zoning change, there was not an application for this project. It was not. That is correct. Did you ask anybody at the city whether or not there were any changes to the height limitation you ask yes no i didn't ask him specifically about changes i met with the folks uh in, in his department assuming that their job was to tell him what things that are going on would impact it i think that would be a reasonable assumption by anyone that uh, that's why you meet with them that's why i say i felt it was a cooperative uh process not an adversarial one which when you keep stuff from the folks you're supposed to be helping, 
sounds adversarial to me. Um, do you know the heights of other buildings in the area? Uh, the one that I compare it to, which kind of, uh, which did more or less uh, push me toward this, is the uh, condo building that's not quite directly across the street from me. That, that was a large tube structure. I have pictures here if anyone would care to see them, but they, the corner. yeah, right at the top of the depot. Do you know how high that is from the, you know, the front of that building? It's what's that the like, terrace? Well, that building is on uh, Space Mountain Park. Yeah. Right, so the parking lot. Bottom end of Lake Do you know what it is when it's measured from the front of the building? I do not. All right, Scott, isn't isn't the issue here that the front of this building is Depot Street? So the apartment building. Being referred to fronts on technically North Avenue. Right. So it's measured and it's within 10 feet, right? So it's measured just from the front. It's 45 feet, right? It's a 35 foot limit. They got 10 extra feet for the inclusionary. Uh, this is sort of in the reverse, right? Rather than having the slope go away, the slope goes up. Like if this house was accessed via North Avenue, this would be the rear of the house. We wouldn't be having right. this discussion. Right. Yep. Because the lot doesn't have access from North Avenue. This is the front of the house, and we have to have this discussion. Right. Um, so the 5 12 2022 plan here to be setting up for construction. Where did that come from? I'm looking to see which one you're referring to here. Oh, so this guy right here. It was the original plan that it was developed based on the original Article 5 requirements. The bottom of the second floor and the bottom of the top floor is that is that equal with the sidewalk? Do you know how the boat that is to the sidewalk? Um, sure, I understand which the sidewalk on North Avenue. Oh, the sidewalk on North Avenue. The upper level is yes, pretty much, pretty much. It's right on the same level as the parking lot of the police station, and so that it's all pretty much the same level. So yeah. that's design. If I was on North Avenue, yes, yeah. 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 you would see one story. I would see one story. Where is it? Essentially, like that response. All right, there's our comic relief. Yeah. Sorry, so one big I can see my favorite. Yes. But this property doesn't, it doesn't front on the sidewalk. No, it does not. It does not. Right. It originally, oddly enough, it originally had a North Avenue address of 31 North Avenue. Um, which um, this is a little odd since there isn't really an access for the Maybe they intended Does the to property line run to North Avenue? No. It ends somewhere. It ends right, right. right at the property line for the folks and from the condo association behind us, and it borders actually on that part of the uh, police station parking lot. It's along the south border of the, the whole police, actually, the police property line goes right down the side of my. Can you tell me more about your understanding of what the difference in height measurement? Because the height mm -hmm. limit did not change from the time they were 
No, was the measurement it was still 35 20. feet when I started. Yes. Um, can you explain what your interpretation was mm -hmm. about what sure. where the height would have been measured and what the height of this design would have been? Sure. Um, if it's helpful, I have both the one that was in place when I started and the one that changed just before I didn't mind. But uh, what it is essentially is it was. A, um, you take the average of the elevation all the way around the house. So like at the back, it might be 10 feet and, as you're, and it's going to increase, um, you know, as you're going down the slope. So on the front, you're going to measure um, from the lower level. So you take the average elevation all the way around the house and that average needs to be less than 35. So that more or less means kind of halfway up the slope of the where the footprint of the house is. So that would be the, uh, that's the height that you would determine as the acceptable height. And the new, the new one just looks at it from the depot street side. So you can start right there and you just measure up, get 30. So it doesn't take the slope into consideration at all as a part of the design process. So there's nothing that, that would make that accommodation in the sequence. I have a question for Scott. Yeah. Scott, are there any exceptions to height for RM waterfront some bonuses or anything like that? Uh, there are there are bonuses. I don't think they affect height in the residential districts, it's lot and coverage and units. I think mean, there's height. If there is, it's for something like inclusionary or mm -hmm. housing and city single family or something like that. But, uh, no, not even historic. If it was inclusionary or um, senior yeah. housing. Okay. But, yeah, I think those are just uh, lot and coverage and units breaker. That was probably related to that was the um, exceptions in the waterfront, uh, RM district about being you folks being allowed to go up to sixty. So that's where my sixty foot number came from. Was that um, you're allowed to make exceptions up to that height um, under whatever circumstances you find it appropriate, I suppose. And I have that here if it's helpful for you if you want to read it. Scott D. The variance for the setback mentions um, it's based on the average of three properties, which all have North Ave addresses. Yep, this is the 10 foot. This is the 10 foot setback. And those were used because they also have Depot Street addresses. Right, so the neighboring properties here, um, Mary and I were just talking about this before the meeting, are through lots. So they have frontage on North Avenue and Depot Street. So zoning, they have two front yards. All the buildings are up by North Avenue, right? So they have fairly close setbacks to North Avenue. What we would call the rear yard is actually the Depot Street front yard, are actually pretty deep. This lot sits between them and doesn't have North Avenue frontage. So, as I recall, front yard setback based on the average is actually behind the rear property lines, right? That's your variance. It's impossible to build in compliance. So, that's why the 10 foot front yard setback here is just granted because you can't have a compliant building on the road. Is there a sign that some consideration for how big the building envelope has to be to be compliant. Like if you could have a 200 square foot house. I don't know. So the variance is because you literally built it there. There was no buildable area. Right. But there's not a standard on how much buildable area, how much square footage can be built. That's, um, that's not. Yeah, I, correct. I mean, there's this sort of squishy language about the minimum variance possible, 10 feet, 
seemed to be where he did the ball. So, yeah. It could have been 15 feet, it could have been five minutes. And, AJ, can I have a question? I have a question for the applicant. It's of course. Um, I'm, tr I'm trying to figure out how much of this height separation of the top two floors from the parking garage, parking level, is to gain a better view from the site. Is that obviously that different? Yeah, obviously that is a consideration anytime you're in a, a scenario where you're on the waterfront and looking over the lake. But uh, what more or less control that was um, getting the upper level to have access to the uh, the back of the lot, which is level, and also uh, to North Avenue, of course, and to get it out of the ground because uh, the original design, uh, the intent was to minimize the uh, amount that we would be disturbing that whole slope. Uh, and uh, with that design, there was the southeast corner of the middle level. Um, we actually uh, you know, would have to do a little bit of excavating to get that clearance there. But the, uh, the whole intent was to get it up to where the upper level had access Obviously, we were trying to maximize the, you know, any uh, view, if you would, as well. It's just common sense part of the design. But uh, the intent was to get it up out of the uh, out of the ground and get it so we had access to North Avenue without having to go up, uh, you know, whatever set of stairs or whatever might be involved and keep it out of the ground. So this um, elevation right here of the top level. Mm -hmm. Is basically set to line up with the flatter area at the top of the property. Is that what you're that, saying? That is correct. And then the overall height on this thing measured from the way they're measuring it now with the garage door up to the top, what is that? Uh, it was like 62 feet. So I had to, you know, to meet the target that I was. Uh, Putting in place, which was uh, for the to meet the exception, was uh, just a little bit shorter, so I would be a little below the upper level. Thank you, the audience. Any other questions for the applicant for the board? Um, I think that's. Very helpful. Uh, certainly, I appreciate this. It was definitely on my side, so I thank you for that. I would like to hear some members. Of, I know there's a bunch of members of the public here who want to speak on this application of this front end. So we'll give them an opportunity. All right. And I'll be able to come back and add some more after that. I mean, I still have more conversation I need, want to well, have with you folks. I'm going to be direct with you. Mm -hmm. I'm giving you 40 minutes on a relatively simple request from our perspective at, um, and i'll give you an opportunity to respond to the neighbors but mm -hmm. i told them to be pithy we understand the issues and we've given 40 minutes is substantial um and so i'll give you an opportunity to respond to them but we have all of your materials we've read them it's a diligent board that does that and i do want to keep this moving we have other items on our agenda so I'm going to give the neighbors a chance to speak and give you an opportunity to address what they say, but I will make everyone be terse about this. Okay. Um, just to quantify the, the last part that I was um, intending to address with you is to go through uh, my uh, variance responses as, as compared to the ones that were generated by, uh, by Scott and that came up with the adverse findings. So uh, that's the one area that I think is uh, pertinent that hasn't really been totally addressed. We've read both Scott and your filing. So I guess I'd say, unless there's something you wanna to add to something. No, just wanted to make sure we were covering all the bases because it may not be a big deal for you, but it is for me. 
Um, so I just want to make sure that we aren't we, overlooking anything. We understand that everybody who sits in that chair, this is the most important thing that they currently have on their plate. Sure. We respect that. We respect that the neighbors care. Thank you. We respect that this is important to you, both financially and personally. Our job is to get it to right. And I appreciate that. So with that, I know we have a number of neighbors. The last, you know, Pete, what the person in front of you just said, if you agree, say I agree. We appreciate that. So I'll, I'll leave it to you who wants to start. Thank you. My name is Susan. I'm at 33 North Susan, Ave. Susan, you want to come up and sit sure. on the You want to Maybe sit here and sure. I'm Thank getting you. out of your way. So. <laughs> I'll just be very brief. I live at 33 North Ave, which is the. Where is that relation to this? Um, it's on the flat side, which would be Ms. Bromley's backyard, is what we consider our backyard, which is it. Okay. Okay. And we're in North Ave. I'm on number five, which is the um, second floor, uh, southernmost apartment. I live with my husband. Um, it's a very unique property, as stated. I don't know if you folks ever do field trips. Well, I think it would be worthwhile for you to see both from Depot Street and from our building in the yard. That's all I want to say. Absolutely. I, I, I've run by it many times and know the view well. And so it's a spectacular view. There's no doubt about it. Depot site a lot. I remember when this came up before us multiple times that we've seen on this. I yeah. think we're all familiar. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Louise Grill, 33 North Avenue, apartment eight. Um, what about solar panels? It's really a question for you. Are you gonna put solar panels on the roof or behind it? Yes, and, and actually that was part of the discussion that they have uh, read about in, in all of the documents. If it's a design similar to this where it's high enough, it'll be on the roof. But if it's the lower one, then I would be uh, uh, in a position where the only practical place is on the upper level uh, part of the lawn up there that I would be doing um, something in that area. Um, if you were to look at the drawings that I presented, um, it would show that uh, if with the lower level, there is a, uh, the pedestals with the solar panels on it. Sally Edith, 33 North Avenue. Is that in, okay. okay. Well, thanks, go ahead. 33 North Avenue, apartment seven. I'm just curious what the actual distance is between the, your lot that's in front of our building, mm -hmm. how many feet it is to our building. I know, I'm asking the detail. I can tell you how far it is to the back line of my lot, but I don't know from the back line of my from lot. From the back line house. to the garage. Yeah, I don't know right that distance. If I place. had to hazard a guess, it would probably be 40 or 50 feet. I think it's well, I think it's less. Is it less than that? Much less. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's I, not. I never long. really. I'm just <laughs> right. looking at it in my mind. In front of me, but yeah. You can. <laughs> <laughs> it's yes, it's right there. Hello, hi. I'm Mark Johnson, 33 North Ave, apartment 11, and I have no no qualms about. You know, Mr. Trombley has has worked with us cooperatively. I have to say, when I look at the plan, and I and I know that going this high, uh, this high, is going to block the direct view of some of the owners of, of of the condominiums. So I wonder exactly what the justification is. And I think even if you just look at this, I'm not asking anybody to live in a cave, but I think this could be dropped down eight feet without living in a cave, but myself. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not an engineer, but when I, when I look at this, this extra space, this extra lift, that it looks, uh, doesn't look all necessary to me. But 
like you say, I, you know, I feel like Mr. Trump is going through the process. He bought the property, and so we'll see. Uh, see what the rules are. So, so I, I, I read, and it looked like the recommendation was not to approve this. Not sure if all those specifics have been addressed, but uh, that's that's all from me. Thank you. So um, certainly that's fair. That's a concern that I would have if I were back there as well. Um, now, and frankly, I got in trouble for not doing this correctly. Uh, they, uh, the trees that were on there were substantially higher than what this building is. And so that whole lot was already uh, had a much more restricted um, view than it will have when I'm completed even at this level it was uh, the trees at the top of the slope there were probably you know at least 30 or 40 foot trees so whatever um, view they have they have gained as opposed to lost with this process so hi, hi. i'm jenny gillespie also 33 north avenue i'm unit 16 um your property will not affect my view. I'm yeah. on the fourth floor counting the um, the garage and then th three floors. Um, time's gotten away from me, but several years ago, our driveway totally washed out and the embankment totally washed out as we are in the top corner watching the river. My big concern is is this bank strong enough to hold this? Yes. And, and what kind of studies have you done to assure that? Sure. And we watched the other apartments being built in the embankment, which mm -hmm. was engineering defined. I mean, mm -hmm. I couldn't believe how they did it. But um, that bank is pretty fragile after watching it get washed away. Oh, I would imagine it is. Um, now, Two things, of course. First off, uh, this bank is, um, for the most part, been there for a century or more. But to answer your question about how I know that it will be okay, is we did get a, uh, a soil engineering firm in, and uh, I'm surprised you didn't notice them out there. But we yes, were, we did, but was, I never saw results oh, from from the, okay. from yeah, the firm. Yeah, no, they haven't been posted at, or or uh, uploaded anywhere. Uh, but they uh, did the um, full soil sample process, um, and I've got the engineering report, which I'm, you know, quite happy to share with you if you like. But it uh, so it, with the it plans, proves, the proves that it can hold this. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. Couldn't hold that rainstorm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, granted, that was uh, that rainstorm and yeah. that work. So the runoff of the water and everything, you know, yeah. I, I mean, it was very dramatic for oh, everyone. I, I, Mark showed me the uh, videos. Uh, Being but, there that night and mm -hmm. and the the river. Sure, so. it was. Uh, Remind everyone that this is not irrelevant to, to it that. doesn't include any development in this right. specific application. It's just the variance. Okay, and so when, with the development application there would be additional detail right. along those lines. that would address my concern yes yes okay thank if, you if the variance is right if right. yeah i mean something's going to happen there one way or another um <laughs> so given that the uh, i'm also 33 avenue and um, aunt elizabeth christie um, given that it's already been stated that he wants to raise this in order to um, get the best view possible, as well as to get away from the public thoroughfare of Depot Street, it would seem to me that that is lacking what I would consider a hardship case when a building of an appropriate height can be built on this lot. And um, it would seem to me to be setting 
and this is your business, but um, a precedent that you might not want to be setting in granting a variance based on view, accommodating view, and getting away from the public, which this lot has always been on Depot Street. That did not change. That's absolutely true. Uh, the issue that I have is that this process started with a set of rules that allowed me to do this, and then uh, they were changed. And I understand. I, I heard that. It was changed, uh, you know, in the middle of my process without me being uh, notified. I understand. Yeah. I heard it. Okay. I heard yeah. it. Yeah. So, um, and, and I totally... Uh, understand your perspective from there as well so that's why i'm trying to be as accommodating as i can and still do what we our original intent was you know okay so. i just wanted to point that out sure. that it hardly seems okay. a hardship case when you bought the lot knowing exactly where it was in the first place and uh, and that it was capable of being designed this way when i bought it All right I'm all on the same team. I'm a different team. Are you the members of the public which to speak on this application? Uh, we have a couple of folks on Zoom. AJ. Okay. Who do we got on Zoom? Uh, let's see. Let's start with Sharon Butcher. Sharon, you're up if you want to speak. Hi. Good evening. Hey. Thank you for letting me speak. Um, uh, I listened to this and um, I believe that this project, I believe, complies with this, the steep slope ordinance, um, I hope. Um, but my question was that I, when the, bore, the soil was tested for stability in the slope, was that done before or after the tree removal? And the reason I asked that is that we all we are aware that tree roots provide a lot of the stability that we have in steep slopes. And so I just wanted to understand when that was done in relation to the tree removal. And um, now the roots, of course, are still viable, but as time goes on, they will become, they will rot and they will decrease the stability of that slope. And so I'm certainly, I certainly hope that that has all been factored in because I want it to be safe for whoever lives in this house and for the abutters um, that could be impacted also. Thank you. That would be the police station. Um, so let me just also make another comment that, that those are concerns that we would address in the permitting stage of the actual development. We're here very narrow focus is on whether or not a variance to a height of up to 60 feet is appropriate. Uh, whether or not the actual structure is permitted or approved or would be permitted and approved, subject to the concerns of the steep slopes and the erosion and the stability would be all something that we'd have to work out in actually permitting. Construction. This is simply the narrow question whether the height may be. And I understand that design is for illustrative purposes. Yes, generally. absolutely. There, it's, uh, I don't want to call it a cartoon, but it's, it's not. Conceptual it's conceptual. Thank you. All right, so we have one more. Rory Waterman, you want to speak? Yes, uh, thank you for taking the time. Uh, I, I'm also 33 North Ave, unit number nine. Uh, my view would be unaffected by this change. Um, but I, I agree with my neighbors and I am, you know, I think it is an important moment to consider why the board changed the rules in the first place and why they would give an exception at this particular point, even recognizing that Mr. Trombley feels uh, misled in his process initially. So thank you for the time. Let me know, we don't change the rules. Uh, Other people change the rules, I can apply them. So, AJ? Yeah. If I may. Um, I noted this in the staff report, but it sounded like I need to say it again. Um, the method for measuring height on this, um, the application that was denied, <laughs> did not change. 
And Scott, when you say the application that was denied, you're talking about in September 2022 and the application for a house. Is that application appealed? The denial of appeal. Well, I was ready to create a adversarial thing so, on my part. I thought, I thought we so could. The rules that were in place at that time of the completed application didn't change, or you're saying before that the change would not have been. The amendment that's getting all that airtime tonight um, did a couple things about changing the measurement methodology. One of the things that changed was you want to be back up. There's two options for measuring height. One is from the front, basically going to the sewer sewer sidewalk, and there's around the entire building. So one of the things this amendment did was it pushed 10 foot. So from sidewalk or curb, whatever the case may be, to and including 10 feet, got pushed back to 50 feet. The application that was denied had a 10 foot setback. It was measured from just the front. The amendment did not affect it. There was a prior amendment, uh, but it was for uh, years before Mr. Trombley bought the property, that actually limited the height. There was this provision, which frankly was aimed at what's now Cambrian Rise, that used to be waterfront, medium density residential, uh, up to 60 feet. That went away. That went away years ago. I mean, Mr. Trombley's painting an adversarial process, and I'm sorry for that, but I'm pretty good at what I do, and I don't have the information. The height methodology didn't change this application. I would disagree. I've got the verbiage right in front of me here, and I'll be happy to read both of them to you. And I'm not sure how you would interpret one to be the same as the other. So, I uh, know you. I, I would too. You go. You, you go. I'm not sure I fully understand your perspective, Scott. So, tell me why you think the height calculation didn't change in the in the application for the home that was denied. It had a 10 foot setback, probably because of the variance. Then at 10 feet, you measure just the front under the old rings and under the new rings. Didn't change. If this house was proposed, let's say 30 feet back, then yes, it would have changed, right? Because the 10 foot just front. <laughs> the home that was proposed was at 10 feet, right? The old regulations said measure just the front at 10 feet. New regulations push that thing. They say measure the uh, height of the building at 50 feet from the property line. No, the difference was under the old regs, within 10 feet of the front property line, right? And again, what was denied yeah. was 10 feet. So measure within 10 feet. Just measure the front facade. And, okay. Now, the amendment that was passed. Push that all the way back to 50 just measure the front facade. So it has to be 55 feet, let's say, before you measure around the entire building. All I'm saying is that it would be 10 feet, it would have been measured under the old regulations. The same just the front end. Right. The only thing that changed was this one years before the And what was the basis for the denial of the earlier application? I don't remember. It was the height. I think it was something to do with the height. That was the only issue, was the height. So uh, you're saying that the fact that it nowhere mentioned the uh, 50 foot horizontal distance in the uh, Article 5 that was existing when I started this process. Um, then it does now that that's not a change. No, I don't quite follow. All right, yeah, let, me, uh, let me just read something to you. Yeah, let's do this. Um, please read up those last if we ones and what it changed, and then we're going to close the public hearing. That'd be fine. Yeah. Okay. So the one that was in place when I started this process, starting point of the building height shall be measured from the one that's as Scott is referencing is there's an A and a B. A, the public side 
sidewalk, alley, or other public way where it is within a 10 foot horizontal distance of an exterior wall on the front of the building, or B, the average finish grade within a 10 foot horizontal distance of all exterior walls of the building. In cases where a property line is within a 10 foot horizontal distance of an exterior wall, the average grade shall be measured between the property lines. Okay. Um, and honestly, uh, Scott's uh, referencing the 10 feet from the front of my property line, but it's actually more like 20 feet to the edge of the road, which is how I would interpret that first one is not a property line, it's the public uh, way, which is the street. The new one, the A version shall be measured from a public sidewalk alley or other public way or space where the proposed building street face facade is within a 50 foot horizontal distance of the lot's street frontage. There was no mention of 50 foot in the first one anywhere. B, the average finish grade within a 10 foot horizontal distance of the building's street facing facade where the proposed building is more than 50 feet horizontal distance from the lot's street frontage. So both of the new ones had this 50 foot uh, provision in there. It was in neither of them before. And it was, a, it was uh, an or, A or B. So B in the originals allowed me to do that. And uh, frankly, anything that had to do with measuring this height it wasn't brought to my attention. I don't know how you uh, say that was not part of what should have been a discussion from the beginning. Uh, that's what I trusted that was happening was that I was being given all of the information so that I could make the appropriate decisions which would have had that application completed well before the new stuff was published. Well, I appreciate you reading that. That's helpful, thank you. Um, I'm going to close the public hearing item on this agenda. I expect the board will try to be really on this tonight. Um, we, we try to do that and we'll get a decision out quickly. We know it's important. We know frankly, I'd rather one way or the other is important for you to move forward. Right. Project. And and frankly, I'd rather have you take a little extra time. It's been a year since we started this process, so if I had to wait a little extra, I'd rather you folks have the time to deliberate as needed. Then. So thank you, and um, public hearing is closed on this. Move on to the next agenda. Thank All right. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry to take so long. So, question: Are we doing any meetings to have parking management about your own sphere? The other. Seems like an office where they make it what they do. Separate. Right? Well, like third atmosphere. You are here for your department. You're not here for city place. That's not next. Oh, I thought it was. It is. Yeah. Yeah. 75 Cherry Street is next. Yes. Okay, I thought I was reading the agenda correctly. I pulled it off the web just today, just to make sure. Okay. This is just for the public. Um, our law firm represented a prior owner of this property. Uh, we have no involvement with current ownership at this time. Uh, and I don't think our firm's prior involvement would influence how I consider this, and I consider myself an objective decision maker and would like to provide no issue. And uh, my firm was previously involved with the prior landowner. Ooh, what was it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they have the city. And uh, I do know Mr. Farrington from around the way, but I have made objective decisions on this and have no concerns. My ability to make an objective decision here. All right, good. So, uh, maybe sit briefly, take us through what you're doing. 
Yeah, um, if I can share screen, it might be actually a little quicker because I can control where we go and I don't want to go through everything. I think we can go through this pretty quickly. Um, let's see if I just gonna stretch this out and get the button if back. I preamble, Justin, yeah. review is very limited here. And the reason it's reformed is because changes are within the discretionary height. That helps, thank okay. you. Okay. It, it's pretty short. And it's limited because of the date that it's in. And, and it's limiting because of the district. Most of it is checklist reviews. So, Got it. So you don't wander off the path. We won't. <laughs> <laughs> so Jesse, wander. I, I, don't, I won't wander either. No, nobody wants to yeah, wander. You need to turn your volume up and your mic, uh, mute your microphone. Mm -hmm. Yep. I, I don't have the ability to do that yet, but as soon as you let me in, I will do that. Will be echo. So I am muted without video uh, and able to share. So, um, and apologies for Lucy's prior comments, but don't let it reflect on the applicant. Um, so, uh, yeah, I did not intend to bring her here, but a previous meeting ran, ran late. There we go. So um, very briefly, um, the project is adding, is, is basically changing the, um, use of what was formerly a mechanical penthouse at the top of the building. Um, there we go. And um, I should be more patient, that's all. Um, as you know, it's under construction. Uh, what you're seeing here is a before and after. This is the original application. Level nine was a restaurant. Level 10 was a mechanical penthouse. We switched to an all electric mechanical system where most of the mechanical needs for the residential units is contained within the residence itself. So there is no need for a mechanical penthouse. Um, as people are probably well aware, restaurants are closing because they can't get staff, uh, not an attractive space to lease. So uh, to help with financing the project and getting this built, we changed levels nine and 10 to residential uses. So this uh, linear balcony that kind of differentiates these upper level units from the lower level units was added and is approximately where this line was previously. And um, so it's basically one extra level of the primary mass of the building. And then there's a step back and uh, at the area where we previously had the mechanical penthouse, those are upper levels of two-story condos. Um, so it is basically a change of use and the height change is, um, there's a good, uh, comparison further into this presentation. Um, but this is, uh, basically, uh, summarizing what's going on. So the actual height of the building, if I move my little window off the screen, um, is lower than it was previously. Yeah. This is my computer, um, that's not letting me move this, but. Okay, we, we, we have yep. yep. So really that's what we're here for is this this added height um, and the change of a mechanical penthouse to an occupied level. May I correct? The height, the total height is less. Correct. Yeah. The zoning the height is taller. Less. The measurement height is different because now we're measuring measuring to occupied floor and not mechanical. Not mechanical. Yeah. If I'm looking at it. It'll actually technically be lower than the 40 feet, 40 feet lower. 50 feet lower than the 2017. But who's counting? <laughs> I've done a lot of these reports. Is the visual, can you go back to the visual mm -hmm. presentation? Is it just that it looks higher because uh, there's no longer a step back in those last two? The, there was a step back that was essentially two floors high. There's now a step back that's one floor high. There were, yeah, there were basically two step backs. There was a step back um, in front of the restaurant, and there was a step back to the mechanical penthouse. We needed to do the step back for the mechanical penthouse to count as a mechanical penthouse and not be subject to the height rules. Okay. Barry, doesn't the uh, form based code require some of those setbacks? The setbacks, yes, are required, and they are in the right, right optional places. 
I shouldn't say optional. There is a, a range where they are required and it does meet those. Thank you. I love Lewis in the restaurant, but I understand it. Um, any other questions from the board? Any members of the audience here to speak on this one? No. Right. Uh, AJ, we do have someone on Zoom. Sorry, to speak. Uh, um, Sharon Busher has her hand up. If anyone else on Zoom wants to speak at this item, raise your hand. Sharon, you can speak. Hi, um, and I understand the parameters of this. I just wanted to speak to the fact that I feel that um, I understand that the need for, well, what motivated the change in use. Um, I feel that a high-end restaurant on top of a building that has a, a wonderful view is very different beast than some of the restaurants that are street level. So I think that's maybe going to be a misstep. Um, and I'm not sure why the observation, the public observation component was eliminated. First of all, in Moran, there was going to be that opportunity with the ice wall and there was gonna be an observation area, public, open to the public. And then in this structure, there was going to be public space. And I know that that's an amenity and I realize it's being swapped for an essential, which is restrooms at the street level, which are certainly needed. But I feel that there's a big loss to the public. and. I'm mentioning this at the DRB because I I feel someone should be watchdogging all of this, and I'm disappointed. I'm terribly disappointed in in how some of that space wasn't retained for public access, and I needed to state that. Thank you. Can I say something? Yes. Hey, hey, Sharon. This is Dave uh, Farrington. We, we, still do, we still do have the public assembly space inside the, the South building. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, meeting rooms there, really flexible rooms with uh, catering kitchens and all that stuff. We we're just getting a lot of, lot of heat from uh, insurance uh, review people about having just a public observation space. And it was going to cause us to have to almost cage it in so somebody couldn't, you know, try to fly. And uh, we'd be back here again looking for some sort of change, and they probably wouldn't like what we'd have to do to, to create public space up on the roof. I, I understand. As as, Thank you. As far as the Thank restaurant you. goes, you know, we're looking at probably close to $5 million in expenses. And after talking to about 30 different restaurant people who, you know, they'd say, how much do you have to charge for that space? And it's two or three times what they're paying now for rents down at street level. And uh, they're barely making it as it is. It was a, a automatic lose-lose situation. Yeah, I just, um, the, the public access, and I understand, I thank you for addressing my concerns and I, I appreciate the liability. I still think it's a loss for the public, but thank you. Um, thank you, Sharon. Scott, anybody else on Zoom? Uh, nobody else. Okay. Well, with that, we'll close the public hearing. Okay, on this one. Um, moving right along. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. We'll back to the reviews on the giant pit. That's our yeah. five-star manager. <laughs> they're they're awesome reviews. They're worth reading. Uh, uh, historic landmark uh, yeah. spot. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, the next so. item on the agenda is the joint institutional parking management plan. They are online. We have joint institutional parking management plan folks online. 
Uh, we do. Sandy, um, do you guys, does anyone need to be panelists to share screen or are you guys okay as is? Uh, yes, if we could um, get access to share our presentation. Uh, Karen Sentoff from VHB. Okay. So Karen should be made panelist. Okay. Yes. Thanks. And Josh Katz is on the phone. Yep. Does, does Josh need to display too or no? No. So I have no. Sandy, Josh, Karen. Does anyone else need to speak for a presentation? Nope. I think just me on this one. Um, all right. Is there anyone from the public? Uh, there, there is. Do you want to swear everyone in collectively? Yeah. Okay. So if you want to speak to this item, raise your hand, please, and I'll enable you to speak for swearing in. Awesome. If you um, are testifying on this item, please um, raise your right hand and swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth under the pain and penalty of perjury. If you all agree. I do. I do. Yeah. I have to make a disclosure. Yes. So, You're being sworn in as well. Uh, our firm occasionally represents UVM and UVMMC uh, items related to land use and permitting parking issues. Um, I don't think that work is very occasional for the new firm ruling objectively on this request, but we will dispose it and see if there are any concerns forward or members of the Okay, um, over to you, Karen, if you want to start and walk us through this. Actually, if I can just do a quick intro. Okay. Yeah, so my name is Sandy Tebow. I'm executive director at CATMA, the Chittenden Area Transportation Management Association. And joining me tonight is Josh Katz, CATMA's analyst, who's been leading this five-year joint institution parking management plan project along with our consultant, Karen Sentoff at VHB, um, who will lead the presentation. Um, and I did just wanna thank the city, st the city planning staff and the planning commission and the public for their input and feedback on this report and all and our annual updates. You know, we've continued to work on improving the content of the plan um, with the feedback we've received it continues to evolve and um, particularly over the past few years. Um, this particular five-year update um, is reflective of the city's amendment to Article 8, eliminating the minimum parking requirements, which both Scott and the Planning Commission described in their memos. Um, so we have submitted the plan itself. And I just also wanted to note that there is a supplement um, with this plan that basically includes the data pieces that are mentioned in the plan. So just wanna thank everyone for their questions, their input and comments to continue to improve this document um, to serve uh, the best purpose that it is um, supposed to do. So with that, I will turn it over to Karen. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And I'm just going to take a moment, hopefully, to share the correct screen here. Hopefully, you all are now seeing a set of presentation slides. And I'm going to try to get your faces back here on my other screen so I can actually see what's happening in the room. All right. Uh, really appreciate your time this evening. Um, here to talk about the 2023 to 2028 uh, Joint Institutional Parking Management Plan. Um, and as Sandy said, um, you know this has been in development um, certainly under under our purview here um, with with a lot of support and, and guidance from from a multitude of folks. Um, but you know, has been an evolving plan um, over over the course of its of its existence, and so can appreciate coming into this process and and um, sort of 
building on the shoulders of many others uh, and, and jumping into this. Um, so really the process that we're in uh, today, we're here in this sort of third box that you see on the screen um, where we're presenting um, to the Development Review Board. Uh, and have gone through, um, you know, two rounds of of talking with the planning commission on on this and and discussing the details. Um, and you all have seen um, the recommendations from the planning commission regarding regarding uh, both the the plan um, and its supplement. Um, and we really wanted to highlight uh, this evening um, some of those key discussion points, um, places where maybe there was some additional detail um, that we would we would provide and, and hopefully have a discussion around that, that this evening um, to, to clarify a few of those points. Um, you know, with the development of this, um, we aimed, as, as Sandy said, both to be responsive to the changes in ordinance, so sort of a shifting and evolving um, beast here, and also, um, you know, address the DRB ap approval um, of the 2020 to 2022 GIP. So that was a two-year GIP. Um, really, in those findings um, from, from 2022, um, it indicates the intent of this to be a five-year plan um, and, and have a five-year approval timeline. Um, that's also consistent with the recommendations that you see in the memo from the Planning Commission um, and, and with um, the ordinance, the Article 8 ordinance. So a few key areas of discussion um, that were highlighted in that memo uh, that we wanted to bring forward and, and speak to this evening um, as, we, as we present some, some of the high-level information coming out of the plan here. Um, the peak parking demand margin of error um, want to address um, that that piece of this and and how we um, both are looking at it in this in this plan and in this iteration, um, but also how we're, we're planning to step forward um, and and hopefully mitigate any any issues around that um, in in plan updates, annual updates and and future plan updates. Uh, the future parking um, projected deficit for Champlain College in particular, um, speaking to that, and I think that is, is closely related um, to the peak parking demand um, uh, calculations um, that we want to want to speak to this evening. Um, and then the TDM strategy uh, efficacy, um, really, really speaking to how effective are these are these TDM strategies that are being put into place by the institutions. I think we have a lot of opportunity uh, in terms of, um, you know, with with the TDM planning effort at the city level um, and all of the efforts um, sort of at the institutional level and, and um, collaboratively across the institutions. I think we have a lot of opportunity um, to gain better understanding around uh, the effectiveness of, of these strategies. Um, and so we'll highlight a few of the things we can point to today, but also sort of our plans in stepping forward and, and addressing that uh, into the future. Uh, and then event parking management, certainly um, the key concern around um, UVM and their, their events and, and the way they're managing um, parking around those events. Um, so we'll, we'll address that piece uh, with some more detail here. So we took two methods to calculate uh, the current demand um, and really we're viewing this as, as sort of the opportunity to provide two bookends of what we believe to be happening. It's sort of those peak parking times um, on, on each individual campus um, and sort of across the fo footprint of the institutions. Um, so one of the methods that we have um, implemented here and and started back in 2019 um, is the approach in which we're actually doing standardized lot counts across the institutions across their um, parking capacity. And so each institution is conducting those quarterly counts. Um, they do the same dates and, and same um, targeted peak times. Uh, and that way it's sort of consistent across every institution. Um, and that data really is informing our utilization trends um, and, and gives us sort of that ground truth number um, to go by in terms of what's happening in the current condition. Um, and will continue to, to occur on a quarterly basis um, and, and inform those annual updates um, to, to the plan. The other method um, was to lean on the survey that CATMA um, conducts every fall with their membership. And so um, 
in this case for this plan process, um, we leaned on the uh, survey that was conducted in October of 2022, um, and we have weighted that survey data to represent the populations across each of those institutions. And one of the key things that I highlight here with the with the stars you see on the screen there um, are around um, both the solicitation and, and responses from UVM in particular. Um, and that's really what's feeding into um, those larger margins of error than we've had in previous iterations of the Joint Institutional Parking Management Plan, um, that we had changed uh, the, the approach in solicitating responses from UVM um, based on some changes to their sort of approach for survey methods on campus. Um, and as a result, just had fewer responses to lean on um, for informing um, both that current demand measure um, and then if, and then informing the future um, demand measurement. Uh, and with that, um, you know, we have implemented this new approach of also conducting those lot counts and having that information to feed into this. So although um, we're sort of limited in, in the response that we got from the survey method this time around, um, you know, there is that, that other data to lean on, that other bookend to lean on in terms of understanding what's happening, um, in particular on the UVM campus this go round. Um, the other thing to note here is that um, CATMA has been um, working in close partnership with UVM um, to figure out, you know, what is the next step? What is a what is an improved approach um, for the annual survey that that they produce, um, but also sort of stepping forward and making sure that um, those survey methods are in place and, and um, we're not running up against this, this sort of larger margin of error than we're accustomed to seeing for this process. So Karen, I, I don't want to move you ahead, but um, you know, the DRB has seen a number of these over the course of time. Yep. And I wanted to try to focus our conversation on a few of the issues raised. Sure. And you've seen the staff report, right? Indeed. So one of the things that concerns me is the imbalance projected in Champlain College between peak demand and spaces available. How does the Joint Institutional Parking Management Plan address reducing demand? It's a great question. Um, so when we calculated those demand projections, um, we're basically taking that assumption that what's happening on the ground today is consistent with what we anticipate in terms of sort of that modal split uh, will be happening on the ground in five years with the full understanding that we're sort of missing um, the, the effectiveness of those TDM measures that are going to come into play in that five-year time period. Um, a couple of the, the ones that you know, I can point to immediately and we can speak to um, now, and we, we do have some data to, to support if we were to apply a, a quote-unquote TDM credit to um, you know, Champlain College's um, you know, demand, future demand. Um, is the uh, electric uh, assist bike share system. Um, so that is one component that, you know, we, we don't have a bike share system on the ground today. CATMA is um, working, working like mad to get that system in place with, in partnership with um, the institutions, with the city. And, you know, that is, that is an opportunity to reduce demand uh, for parking on campus um, by enabling a system like that. And so I think there are some examples of, of how we can implement those, um, you know, other TDM strategies, um, but we have not in, in this case, um, with the data that we've presented, um, taken any credit for those TDM strategies that will continue to be effective and, you know, uh, above and beyond um, what, what they're able to do in terms of mode split today. Yeah, I could jump in here. This is Josh from CATMA, program analyst working with um, Karen and Sandy on this project. Um, yes, that demand number shows that Champlain College has a negative number of spaces. Um, 
But we also have been conducting um, quarterly lot counts since 2019, um, which give us, I think, a better picture of what is actually happening on the ground. And although um, our survey data and this demand analysis is saying, um, is giving us the higher end of what the demand could possibly be, we have these utilization and lot counts that are showing that uh, Champlain College has a plethora of parking spaces on the ground right now um, during those peak times. Yeah. Um, I think in general, one of the goals of these parking management plans should be to reduce the need for parking through transportation and management programs, as opposed to make sure we have enough spaces to accommodate continued car usage at the same level it's being used today. Right? Um, I know that's a planning commission concern. Just take a minute and walk us through the overall demand management that's incorporated into this plan a little bit more than you already have. Can I follow that up by asking, I think both the staff report and the planning commission notes indicate we need more information on this. And I'm interested to know what data you're tracking with respect to participation and the, and the participation demand management strategies you're using and how you propose as part of this plan to track those important pieces of data going forward so that you can show your measures are being more and more successful over time. So I will let Josh jump in at any any juncture on this, but um, you know, I think there are, and maybe I should skip ahead because we do have a, a slide that speaks to some of these collective TDM strategies. Um, so you know this the strategies that are in place today, but I think more importantly, um, sort of thinking about the efficacy of these and, and how we are planning for, um, you know, monitoring, tracking those into the future. Um, so we could certainly, like I sort of spoke to already, we could lean on how these have been researched in the past or in other places um, and apply those and sort of take some credit um, for those TDM measures when we're doing those calculations out into the future. Um, so two examples here for car share, um, car share Vermont puts out uh, a, a factor of basically saying that for every pod that they add, every vehicle that they add, um, it's it's reducing 15 vehicles um, from, from the system. Um, with the electric assist bike share system, which we know, um, you know, we're, we're hopeful that that's coming online very soon. Um, certainly will serve the institutions in a similar fashion or a more robust fashion than it has in the past um, in, in previous iterations. Um, and if we look to other places, you know, we're talking about 10% reduction in single occupancy vehicles, certainly going to have an effect on our, our parking demand um, across the institutions. Um, the other thing, the other, the other conversations that have been happening uh, in the background as as we um, have developed this plan and and those conversations continue is really um, improving um, the use data that we're getting um, through partnership with um, folks that are providing um, you know those those uh, resources. So Green Mountain Transit, um, better ridership data, um, improved ridership data from from those folks. Um, with CarShare Vermont, their usage data, um, drilling in and, and, you know, getting more information about um, the membership from the institutions um, that are utilizing those um, vehicles and, and making trips via those vehicles as opposed to parking on campus. Um, other other strategies for for sort of monitoring in the future is um, you know Katma is working closely with UVM on um, updating the survey instrument so that um, there are some more targeted questions that really drill into um, the effectiveness of these strategies. Um, they they do a great job thus far with with the survey instrument they have, but um, making sure that those improvements are in place so when they conduct the survey in the fall and, and continue to do that on an annual basis, um, that that information is readily available to us on the back end um, to be able to track and monitor um, institutionally how effective some of those strategies are. 
um, and then and then the one other thing to point to is um, you know Burlington has is is kicking off or has kicked off. Um, I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure what this what the status is of that project at the moment. Um, a, a TDM study looking at transportation options, and I think um, that's really going to provide um, some great context for us in terms of um, you know at at within the city and within our context, um, what what is sort of effective in terms of, of TDM and, and the strategies that are in place and and how can we improve upon that? Yeah, and just to add on to Karen, I would say specifically, thank you for that, Karen. I would say we will, um, on Green Mountain Transit, because it has been free, we haven't been able to get the same level of data from our programming there um, that we've gotten in the past in terms of exact ridership. So, when um, uh, fares resume on in 2024, um, we'll get improved data similar to what we got in the past so we can track um, who is using the bus um, and how many folks are using the bus from those programs. Um, and also the electric bike share system, which we hope to have on the ground this, this summer. Um, we hope to have some news for folks soon on. Um, we'll get improved data from that as well. And always continuing to lean on um, our survey mode split data, um, which we do every year, which shows us what how folks are getting to work. Um, this is Sandy here. Thank you. Just a few more points to add on the TDM measures. Uh, there is um, a regional microtransit study um, here in Chittenden County that the Regional Planning Commission is embarking on. Microtransit is a sort of an up and coming uh, transportation demand management measure. It's a on-demand shuttle um, that has been operating in Montpelier and Barrie successfully. Um, so I'm optimistic that this microtransit option will be implemented here in Chittenden County in the next year or so. And I also think there's new park and rides coming um, on coming out on the ground, uh, the Williston one, um, I think there's another one planned for Colchester. So if we can um, have transit serving these park and rides, that's another TDM measure um, that I think we'll be seeing become more active. Um, and in addition to the city of Burlington's TDM study, the Regional Planning Commission is conducting a TDM study um, as a result of the I-89-2050 study. Um, so I think um, there's a lot of um, activities and initiatives TD, um, related to TDM um, that are coming on board and, and we'll be updating um, all of these measures in our annual updates. You know, we'll be collecting uh, transit data when, as mm -hmm. Josh and Karen mentioned, when the um, fair, the fair, new fare boxes are installed. So we'll have that data, which I think collectively with UVM and Champlain is about three, pre-pandemic was about 300,000 trips. Um, there's offsite parking and shuttles. So there's a number of TDM measures that um, we can better highlight and provide data and um, the next annual update. Sam, do we have anybody from the institutions on Zoom? Uh, yes. No. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you all for that summary. That's really helpful. Um, one of the things I'd really like to see, I, I know you all are doing a lot of work in this area, but in terms of this report and then the annual reports being useful to us for tracking whether you're really meeting the requirements of the ordinance, I think we need to see from you all a proposed matrix of measures <laughs> that you are proposing to track each year um, in the transportation demand area. And I think that in should include data on the number of people that are participating in each program, um, the amount of resources each organization is dedicating to each program, uh, and the reduction in demand that is anticipated from that level of participation. We're not gonna start to make meaningful progress until we track and report specific data points so we can look back and see if your measure is successful. And, and I see that you've done some summaries of that. So you have some information on percentages of people participating in some of these or 
the numbers of people who are participating in car share, for example. But I'd like to see something that looks like a chart where it's got metrics we can understand how they relate to what you're attempting to achieve in terms of transportation demand management. And then each year we can see if you're being successful or not. And we can have a good conversation as a group about what you might do to be more successful. Yeah. So I'll mirror that. I, I feel to be blunt, like I'm being told a lot of stuff that doesn't have any empirical data behind it, A, and B, any way for me to confirm it next year or in three years when this comes up again. Um, I see the numbers on the ground, anecdotally, it doesn't seem to match the numbers. And, you know, well, all the TDM strategies are theoretically beneficial, but I think all of us feel like we have this informational deficit that says, well, are these actually working? And I'll just tell you how I feel. I'd like to, before I take action on this, see that what Jeff just talked about, didn't really click in my head till I said it, see sort of that, okay, how are we gonna track these demand management strategies? What specifically are they going to be? And how are we going to track them? Because, you know, I, I'll be honest, I'm not ready to approve this until we see that. Because I think if we're gonna to shift towards demand management, which the planning commission indicated we should focus on, and I agree with, then how do we track that? I mean, we've we've had other people come in and provide noise tracking and those things, and we understand that this is something I don't think we have a good metric for. I think to, to build on that idea, you know, we were talking about the projected <laughs> utilization of the parking spaces, and, and you've admitted that's without the TDM. So it's like, what is our assumption with the TDM included? So then we're also measuring, are we meeting our expectations for all, all of those elements coming together to actually achieve the reduction in demand and um, utilization coming through in the survey and in, in the parking lot studies? Because um, I think that's part of the gap too. And and comma, if, if if all of that works out that we don't need as much parking, then let's not build it, right? Like that's the other aspect to this. Um, well, there's also the aspect where I saw one note about uh, event management. What what are some of your ideas around that? You have sudden influxes of people, sporting events, graduations. What are the ideas there? Right. What are the ideas for transportation demand management? So I guess where I'm out on this is I would ask that we continue this and get a proposal for tracking demand management that we could consider and incorporate into this. Yeah, I'd like to see that. I mean, I, I, you all have done a lot of work on this. Yeah. I really appreciate the report, and I think it goes a long ways towards addressing the questions we had the last time we saw a proposal. Absolutely. Um, but it also, we're shifting how we're approaching this. So the ordinance has changed. We now have a maximum, not minimums for parking. There's a greater emphasis on TDM, part because of that, but in part because of greater climate goals. Um, so I think we need to start to put as much time into the data tracking on the TDM side as you all are clearly putting into tracking each individual parking space. Is that right? We've gotten good at that because that's what it was focused on for many years. Uh, I think what we're asking you is, is to try to get as good on the TDM side at tracking and reporting useful metrics to us uh, as you have on the parking side. Right? So, do members of the board, they are? No. Uh, I do, though. Yes. Um, forgive me if I didn't see it. Um, I believe many nurses. For the hospital, they park off site and are shuttled to the site. Yes. Um, is that are there any plans on changing that in the future? Um, changing it. Um, uh, uh, can you clarify? Uh, I don't know. Adding more spaces or providing other other options, other 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 parking lots. Um, 
uh, I, I, do you foresee shuttling back and forth to Fannie Allen for the foreseeable future? <laughs> I would say within the five year timeline of this plan, we did not receive any indication that there was going to be a significant change to that satellite parking and, and shuttling service that's provided right now for uh, the UVM Medical Center. All right, thank you. Who is you? Do you have this one? I am Nick Anderson. I, I swore, I just wanted. Oh, okay. I do this. Go ahead. Uh, Nick Anderson, Director of Planning at Champlain College, was the Director of Transportation for many years, now oversee it still. Um, I just wanted to highlight to the board um, one kind of important evolution that this Joint Institutional Parking Management Plan has had, um, having participated in many of them at this point, um, is that we we got to a point where there was too much information in the plan and it needed to be pared down. So previous years, we had bus ridership data for every single trip of every single student and employee. We had uh, our shuttle ridership data, 175,000 students using our shuttle back and forth. Um, we, you know, it is easy enough for us to track all of those things because we already have that data. Um, but we're actually asked in the previous versions of the plan to get rid of all of that information and, and focus on parking lots, right? So, you know, I think it is a direct, uh, this plan is a direct reference to how, you know, it has evolved over time. And I'm hearing pretty loudly, Jeff and AJ, yeah. that we want to go back to, you know, collecting those TDM, different pieces on the TDM, on the TDM measures, yeah. right? Because those are the important TDM measures. Um, and, and we and do I'm not have saying, that. I'm not saying we need like a detailed appendix with every rider. That's well, we need to do that. <laughs> I'm sure you have. But what I'm saying is I would like to see a one or two page matrix that says, here are the important metrics with respect to TDM we're going to track each year. Right. Here are the numbers for this year, year two, year three. We can see trends. We can see whether, the, whether what you're saying is being affected. Yeah, I guess what I'm saying is we don't have to start from scratch today. Those trends already kind of go back in previous gyps for the yeah. last 10 years. Yeah. So we'll be able to kind of pick it up where it left right. off. And that may be helpful historically, but what we care about now is how is it working? Well, continue to see it grow. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that's yeah. what we want. And then the one thing, sorry, Karen, just jumping, is that there's one kind of, I think, really important metric that isn't shown here is the boom of e-bikes. Um, e-bikes really are changing the game when it comes to being able to choose a different mode than a car. And we're seeing that at Champlain. I'm seeing faculty members and students that I have never heard of riding a bike in the 10 years I've been there are, oh yeah, I commute to work on an e-bike now because it's easy. And I wonder, you know, is that while it's not a program or tool, I see that that is going to be a key differentiator in the next five years of how we move. And I think some way of tracking that and, and maybe that leads to that kind of five-year demand not counting any of these TDM measures that I think is a TDM measure that's going to see substantial growth as we go. Which is why I think it's both things. It's like individual elements of the TDM, great, but then it's how are we tracking overall against, yep. not just looking at the detail, but painting that against the, the overall picture here is that we're reducing demand for parking. And so we need that to be one of the KPIs too, if we think yep. all else equal, we're going to be here and we can judge you as successful if you're below that number. Yeah, and something like the e-bike, like if you've got a program that contributes X <laughs> amount to employees purchase that bike, I'd love to see how many employees are taking advantage of that and what the cost, how much Champlain is contributing to that. <laughs> But we also need them to use it instead of a car. We do. So there's a different metric there. I agree. So yep. I think it's being thoughtful about the metrics that will help you all and us understand if the measures you're putting in place are successful or are going to need to be. Correct. All works, Andy. Sorry. Not Thank you. you. Too. <laughs> so with that, uh, I'll make a motion. I'll make a motion that we continue. AJ. Uh, yes. Sorry. Uh, Interrupting. Well, folks online have their hands up. Including the public. 
Um, this is Sandy. Um, I just wanted to sort of echo what um, Nick said about if you look at- Sandy, hold on a second. Oh. Um, so not just the app, we have Sharon Bush wants to speak. Who else? Uh, anyone else from the public wants to speak to this, raise your hand now or forever hold your peace. Until the next one. Until we continue. Yeah, like Let's hear from Sharon. Okay. And we have Jamie Smith with her hand up too. All right. Uh, you. Sharon, you're up. Thank you. Um, I, I'm supportive of the recommendation that is going to be made by the DRB. Um, what I had wanted to state, well, first of all, I used to work at the hospital um, and the, it, when you were talking about nursing, evening and night staff were able to park on site. It's the day staff that has to park on satellite parking. So just so you know, um, so that's a difference in that facility versus other, the other institutions. Um, uh, but I wanted to just talk about the fact that um, I agree with you that there's no way the margin of error was so broad um, that it, it sort of invalidated the predictability of the plan before you. Um, there was no way to figure out if indeed it would reduce the number of cars coming into the city. And these are the, these are the, um, the graphs that you're looking for now. There's no way to tell from this, this plan uh, whether or not it takes pressure off parking in uh, neighborhood streets. And it also didn't talk about, as you said, um, whether or not their TDM, TDM plan, which they've already highlighted needs some help, um, um, was effective. Um, one thing that could be um, monitored is single occupancy uh, vehicles. Um, that percentage has remained stagnant for a while. And so that's something that could be tracked to see about the effectiveness of any TDM measure you put in place. Um, and let me just say one other thing. Um, some of the information is confusing in the plan because it talks about the lofts as being um, uh, off campus housing yet it's on campus and the parking lots are on UVM campus so there there's some accountability there's some flaws in this plan that really need to be addressed um, and I totally agree that um, I I don't feel that there is a lot of confidence in whether or not the measures that UVM and the hospital and Champlain are taking will be effective. Ultimately, it would be good to know if they were going to consider policies at these institutions that would reduce the number of cars coming to their campuses, period. Um, and so I think that's another measure that the gentleman from Champlain spoke about. Maybe there would be less vehicles and more e-bikes in the future, which would help with all the congestion and all the parking lots. So thank you very much. Um, I look forward to seeing what kind of um, graph gets developed and how the DRB will review that. Um, I believe you're reviewing that now on an annual basis, not a report, but you're going to be looking at this information annually. And I think that's very valuable. So thank you so much. Um, somebody else? Yeah, Jamie Smith is, is, the up. is the director of UVM. Okay. Yeah. Well, Jamie has a hand up. All right, Mr. Smith. Ms. Smith, Person Smith. Yes. Jamie. All right. Well. All right. Can you hear me? Yep. Now yes. Can. Okay. Sorry. Had headphones in. Must have been something related to that. Uh, just briefly, um, I just would like to note that I think one of the biggest drivers of and, and full disclosure, I've been on the job for about nine weeks now. So I'm probably the other side of things from 
from my counterpart, Nick, over at Champlain, who has much longer history with all of this. Um, I think one of the biggest drivers in um, reducing parking demand um, and you know, seeing lots that are not full, which is reflected in the lot counts that we have, um, is telework. Uh, telework is something that has really become a new phenomenon um, driven by the pandemic, um, you know, since the last iteration of the gym. And um, I think that that's, you know, that's probably one of the biggest factors to uh, reducing uh, single occupancy vehicles and reducing parking demand on campuses. So, um, you know, I, I think that there's probably places where we can make that reporting more robust going forward. That's it. Thank you. Um, so with that, I'm going to make a motion that we continue the review of joint institutional parking management plan review of proposed 2023-2028 plan and ask that the applicant bring forward a, how would you describe it, Jeff? Matrix of TDM strategies and tracking suggestions. Okay. Uh, uh, any second for that motion? Jeff seconds. All members of DRB in favor? All right. Um, We'll continue it until you submit it. We look forward to it. Don't take this negatively. We just, it's a new focus on demand management as opposed to just how many parking spaces there are. And so when you send us too much information and we tell you that, you can blame Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for your work on it so far. Thank you. All right. Last item on our agenda 655 Spear Street. University of Vermont State Agricultural College proposed construction of a parking lot following the demo. Brad? Yeah. You got us now? Is there a Claire there now? Yes, now I can hear you. Apologies. Claire, your guy just said you don't need this project. Is that right? We did a great job filling in the space. So, uh, ways in space. <laughs> no, do we have that right? <laughs> We've heard a little of the background of the project. Do you want to do anything to describe it? Um, no, if, if Adam or Derek filled you in, they probably gave you um, the details, but um, let me know if you have any questions. <laughs> uh, we, we're, um, so, I think Jeff had a question. I was just asking about the need for this new parking lot. And given the discussion we just had at the Joint Institutional Management Plan parking, tell me a little bit more about how you analyze that this amount, which is a pretty significant amount of new parking area is needed and, and why here? Sure. So in our campus plan, we really try to put parking on the periphery of our main campus whenever possible um, in order to um, make the area around main campus, you know, very pedestrian oriented. So this parking lot, the intent is to use it primarily for fleet vehicles. So it will allow us an opportunity to consolidate and to streamline a lot of the um, fleet vehicles and the buses here um, to really help us with that process. Um, it also will free up some space around campus for some flexibility for possibly some future developments such as housing. So um, we're just looking at opportunities around, you know, properties that UVM already has right around main campus. And this was a great site for us to, to locate our fleet vehicles and also an opportunity to put in a lot of EV spaces and a lot of EV um, infrastructure for this type of um, this type of use. So I think that's that's the main the main purpose. Um, and Jamie Smith hopefully is still here as well. He can chime in um, as director of transportation and parking services as well. Anything you want to add, Jamie? Jamie, is Jamie promoted, Scott? But Jamie can speak. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I've being only nine weeks into the position, obviously, I've kind of come into this project midstream. Um, what I can say is that, you know, from an operational perspective, I think there are uh, a fair amount of advantages 
to moving a fleet that is currently scattered across campus um, to one centralized location. Um, it also potentially creates opportunities, you know, for shared use of vehicles, um, potential fleet reduction through shared use. Um, and then, of course, you know, the aforementioned uh, electrification and, you know, installing an economy of scale with charging stations in one location for that purpose. I guess two follow up questions. Will there, where, will there be shuttle service to this lot from the main campus? As of right now, it's not intended. Okay. Because what you so, described is the parking here is to pick up, it's for the driver. Most, most of them are driving, and I believe we haven't come up with a policy, but some will have the ability to keep their vehicles next to the clock in. If per se, they don't have transportation to get out there, those are scarce and far between. Okay, but I mean, this gets to the exact issue we were just talking about. What about the person who takes an alternative mode of transportation to the university <laughs> center? Uh, I mean, there is a bid needs to get, bid needs to get a fleet vehicle. So they don't want to drive their own vehicle to campus. Correct. They biked, yep. they rode the bus, they're on campus. It seems like we're now just encouraging people to drive their single-use vehicle to go get another vehicle. So tell me about how you would manage that differently. Uh, we are planning to put bike racks just on the lawn out there for parking of bikes, but there is a bike path right there. It's less than a mile from campus. So we bikes at that point, extra two, three minutes to get down the road. Okay. But there's not a need in your view for shuttle service between the campus and here. That's right now, no, because then we'd have to consolidate somewhere on campus, the employees coming into work, then bus them from that location to another. Attorney, there's something else. You asked for a waiver of shade trees. Yes. We have, uh, I would yeah. really need to do a waiver of shade trees. We can't have more shade trees. <laughs> I might interject here. From the um, agenda where it describes uh, 162 spaces in a revision that was reduced to 157. Right. So the staff report reflects that. Yeah. The, the shade trees plus existing trees that were there met the standard. The stormwater plan here on the lower left of the screen. Um, is requiring the removal of four or five existing trees because of the outlet and the collection basin. So in the original application, it looked like it satisfied the tree shading plan. The stormwater plan required the loss of some existing trees and that's why their plan is a little short. Right, so let me be short, let, let me make a short point. Uh, we all focus on a lot of things. I focus on the urban heat island element of that. Can we add a couple more trees? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, it just takes up parking space. Absolutely. Or on the edge or somewhere. We, I don't have the plan, but we have the bottom where the shade, when the sun's coming from the south, we've sort of lined that and we actually lined the east, but it doesn't do much to provide the shade um, to the to the parking, so it's primarily relying on yeah. islands. So we'd have to. I'm not, I'm not asking you to lose parking, but can that is, since we're losing four on the edge, can we find a space for a couple more without reducing parking? Mm -hmm. She's not going to make it come back. But uh, it can certainly fun. play out the peripheries, but I think that they're saying is it may not achieve the goal. Well, you're yeah. losing some of the periphery. Perfect. Put some back on the. Periphery. If you're good, I'll give you more. Sure. It's good. Yeah. 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 Not to be dumb about variants. Oh, oh, God, to be there. This is the landscape plan here. Oh, you can sorry, see sorry. that oh, the okay. trees are all organized around the periphery of the lot where they will create shade. Right. They all cast shade in the upper right direction. I don't know if you have L1 point because we're south here, right? So, yeah, yeah, it's facing pretty much north. Do you have L1.1 one point one for a chance? I, uh, I don't know. Oh, no, sorry. Okay. okay. In the, the shading plan. Yeah, that's that would, anyway. Shading but yes, we can add the five assumptions. Yes. Yeah. 
traffic demand. Uh, no, no, no. Claire, did you did you guys do a traffic demand? Did you look at the traffic uh, changes on Spear Street at all? No, we did not. Um, we didn't. We don't imagine it will be a um, very impactful for traffic. Um, a lot of the um, a lot of the employees that would be using the fleet vehicles operate um, pretty early. So usually, I think like seven a.m. to three thirty. So the they're not usually in the typical um, peak hour. So we did look and and looking through state permitting, we've reached out to the state um, to Chris Clow, and he has told us that the impact we don't we don't require a traffic impact study for the for the state. So we at least know that much. Um, so just because of the hours, we don't think we'll have much of an impact. Well, if, if most of these vehicles are, are dotted about the campus, now they're all going to be here, it's going to be a, quite a bit of for maintenance and whatever, quite a bit of coming and going out of the slot, I would think. I would also, Mary, what would, what would the minimum spaces for, for Triggering an impact study be 75 normally, 75. A traffic study is predicated on at least 75 new peak hour. Peak hour. Peak hour. Yeah. Yeah. That's usually it's based on trips. Trips. And that's usually PM peak. So this probably doesn't trigger that because I just they're all running. Just to file on what Claire said. I do believe the state was reached out. They knew it wasn't viewed as new trips because they already generally exist within the area. That's on the 111 side, right? But not the Active 50 side. That's on the. Uh, I, I, Claire, is that on the, uh, the state? That's on the state 111 permit side? Yes, that's on um, both sides. So we looked at both the Act 145 as well as um, Act 250 requirements. Staff. Right, these, right. these three vehicles typically once out, once in, they're constantly going back and forth. Uh, typically, they'll go to their shops. But what happened now is essentially the vehicles are out their shops and then the personal vehicles are parked next to it. So, generally, twice the number of vehicles, but now it'll be just the one that'll be at their shop. And then at the end of the day, they go drop off their keys, clock out. <clears throat> in theory, they shouldn't be out there. Yeah, and just to understand the relationship of this to, to the joint parking management plan. Is there any issue with us approving this before our joint management parking plan is approved? So this is under the prior management plan. Yeah. That's the short and tidy answer. So because the previous the plan is still limited. in place. The previous plan has expired at this point, but this application that was still active. I guess. <clears throat> um, any more questions from the board? I'd like to close this. Talk about it. All right. Well, with that, I'll close the public hearing on this. And I suspect we'll deliberate briefly on this one tonight. And we have other business tonight. No. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right, that wraps up our public hearing. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. I assume we want to stick around and deliberate board members briefly. On ZP 23-30, which is 120 Hugo Street, uh, I move that we deny request for a variant, understanding there is a lot of history here, but based just on the language of the ordinance, at a minimum, it does not meet the requirement for B, there's no possibility that the property can be developed in strict conformity with the short provisions of the ordinance. I'll second that. Further discussion? All those in favor? All right, sorry, Mr. Trump, that's six, zero, 75. Uh, I move that we approve the application. How is that going to adopt staff findings? Okay, one second. All those in favor? Uh, I'm out. Leo's out. So that's everybody. Five, Sarah. Brad, yes? Yeah. 
I move that we continue our review of the application and ask that the applicant supplement its materials for further review with a brief summary of their trip generation and how they get to the analysis that there's not more than 75 peak trips. And a better understanding of how this parking lot fits into the new joint parking management plan currently under consideration. Got seconds? All those in favor? Thank you. That we are complete.